Hi, William. Welcome. Welcome. It was good right. to see you again. It's good to see you too. This is our second official conversation of chit and cha. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you the cha I'm drinking. This is actually, I'm drinking it in this nice little cup. It looks like a ramekin. It's kind of, it looks like a ramekin. It has a handle though. Yeah. And it is, it is yogi tea. And because Aww. it's yogi tea, it has this pithy thing on the back, which I think yeah. is just another way of telling me to simplify my life. Right. Which, okay, sounds great. What flavor is it? Oh, it's ginger tea. Okay. It's good for digestion. Yeah. I just had lunch. So <clears throat> I'm drinking uh, gamaicha. Uh, I, is, I, have, I don't remember the brand because I think I bought loose one. Uh, I'm actually going to, I think Kristen's going to put up an image of what gamaicha is. It's a Japanese tea. It's basically a Japanese uh, green tea, but they have roasted sort of rice in it. I love so it has, this is really lovely sort of umami and savory note to to just say, uh, it gives a greater sort of sense of depth to sort of just plain green. I've had the same genmai cha in, in like a Korean version of the same mm. tea with the roasted rice, or maybe it's a roasted barley, but it has a similar kind yeah, of- Yeah, yeah, I think it's roasted flavor. barley. Yeah, which actually, interestingly, I'll just very briefly mention, <clears throat> um, this is actually how tea was drunk uh, in sort of, I think in that, uh, I think in the, at least uh, uh, in the Tang Dynasty in China in the eighth and ninth century. So they would sort of drink this tea with sort of roasted nuts, roasted rice, and these sort of sweets mixed in it, almost like a little, maybe not porridge, but sort of like soupy type of thing. Yeah. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. It adds, certainly adds nutrients to the tea. Yeah. Say. Yeah. Yeah. Makes it hearty. It would be nice, like, especially a, in a sort of cold, dreary day. Um, exactly. Like, I was thinking it'd be kind yeah. of a winter tea, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Excellent. Uh, but we should talk about our today's topic. Yeah. Today's topic is touch. Mm -hmm. All right. Yay. Um, and I'm really excited about this. I think I, I kind of want to just go into my images. And yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And sort of just go right right to it. Okay, so my um, first image here. There we go. I think that's right. Mm. Can you see that? Okay, so here we go. Um, touch is my theme, the theme. Um, and so the, initially when, when, we, when we talked about touch, the first thing that came to mind was actually this object that's in the, the Sackler Gallery of Art. It's part of the National Museum of Asian Art. Um, and it's originally, you know, it's, it's dated to the 12th to 13th century. Um, it's originally from the Hoysola, Hoysola dynasty, or Hoysola dynasty, um, in the, which was a Southern Indian kind of kingdom, um, Canada speaking kingdom that ruled from the 10th to 14th century. Um, and this was probably originally part of a temple in a niche or in a, in a small kind of um, sort of altar space, uh, maybe on the exterior or interior of the temple. Um, but now it's in the museum. Um, so here, just to give you a sense of where, this is the Southern India, the Hoysala dynasty was. It had two capitals, one at Halibiru and um, an earlier capital at Belur. Um, and here is the object now in the Sackler Gallery of Art in a room with other beautiful objects. Um, so the reason I, you know, sort of chose this object, first of all, I love Ganesh. Ganesh is a, he always seems like a, he seems like an auspicious character, a jolly character, first of all. He so really who's likes, Ganesh? You should. Yeah, totally. So Ganesh is the elephant headed deity. He's the, he's a Hindu God. He's the son of Shiva and Parvati. Um, Shiva is the, the god of destruction, amongst other things, also creation and preservation in many ways. Um, but uh, Ganesh is, is one of their sons. They have a couple sons. Kartika is the other son. But Ganesh is the elephant-headed son. We don't really have time to go into the whole story about how Ganesha got his elephant head, but it's one of my favorite stories. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Um, 
but Ganesh is the remover of obstacles. He's the God who you mm. um, worship before you, at the beginning of things, before you start anything, before you, you know, take a big exam or before you start on a new project. Um, he's also usually um, in a temple, he's often a, a, an image that you encounter right at the beginning, sort of near the entrance, um, sometimes even showing you the direction that you can circumambulate mm. or walk around a temple. Um, so he has that important function as well. Um, but yeah, you usually see him also at the entrance to homes or um, in the entrance of spaces. Um, so he, you know, Ganesh, Ganesh has a really big belly, as you can see here, and he loves sweets. And I also have a big sweet tooth, so I feel like we can bond on that level. And here I'm showing you a detail of presumably some sweets that he's holding. We don't really mm. know, but it looks like maybe mm. some little ladoos or something that he's holding mm -hmm. in his hand. And it's almost as if he's reaching down to kind of taste the sweets with his trunk, which mm. is, is kind of fabulous. Um, and then he's also holding, if you notice, you can kind of see it from the bigger image, but one of his tusks is broken off and it looks like he's actually holding his tusk in his other hand that's in his, his lower right hand, um, which he uses to write things, including to write, you know, great epics like the Mahabharata mm -hmm. to, um, to dictate or to, to write it down as, um, as others are dictating. So um, he has a couple other things that he's holding. He's got an ax, he's got a cattle goad. Um, so, and there's often, you know, different kinds of things that he's holding, but usually sweets are important things and usually an ax or goad or the tusk or other things that he holds. Um, and so this image has all of those things and it has, he's wearing this beautiful, um, elaborate crown, very ornately carved headdress. And there's a lot of wonderful ornamentation that's so kind of typical of this Hoysala kind of sculpt, uh, sculpture, this kind of carving, um, which is beautiful. But, you know, when I think, and, and I think all of this sort of iconography is really fascinating. And I love thinking about iconography and especially iconography connected with an interesting image like Ganesh. Um, but one of the reasons I thought of this image when, when, we talked about the theme of touch um, is because I remember the places on the stone, sort of thinking about the way that the stone appears to be worn out. Um, and so these places on the stone where it looks like maybe over time, over centuries, people would rub the stone to touch mm -hmm. the stone during worship. And you can kind of see it when you look right at the knees or even at his belly, these places where there's maybe some worn out um, parts of the stone are kind of patina that's built up here. Um, here's a detail of the belly, yeah. at this belly. Um, and even on his trunk, um, it looks like the stone has a slightly different quality, a kind of smoother quality than, it, than the rest of the stone. Um, and this reminded me actually of um, you know, the, an important puja or worship that's done for Ganesh uh, called Ganesh Chaturthi, which happens every year in like September, October, in the fall. Um, and it's a time to celebrate Ganesh. Um, I always think of it as Ganesh's birthday, but I don't know if that's actually right. <laughs> but the idea is you sort of, um, you, you, you have an image of Ganesh, ideally an image that's made out of terracotta, low fire terracotta that will eventually sort of dissolve into water. Um, and then on the 14th day of, of that month, you then immerse the image to go back into water. Um, and I'm showing you here images actually of my mother-in-law um, who is preparing a Ganesh image, a terracotta Ganesh image that she still has. I'll show you an image at the end. Um, and she was preparing this in celebration of Ganesh Chaturthi. And, and the way in which she's touching the image, the way that she's here in these photographs, she's adding kumkum, uh, sort of um, vermilion powder mixed with water and haldi or turmeric powder um, right onto the image. Here she's adding the, the, the tilak that's associated with Shiva, those three horizontal lines right at the top mm. and the tusk of, of the image. Um, she's also adorning it with flowers, so she's sort of um, touching it in that way. Um, but but really the way in which um, her physical engagement with the object during this particular puja, um, I think really um, speaks to those um, those kind of areas of the stone that we see that are worn out. And it, it reminded me, um, 
in general about how, you know, when we talk about puja, usually the thing, the thing that I emphasize a lot in my classes is this concept of darshan, the exchange of glances, to see and be seen by God. And I think that's really an important part. Um, but, but something that is also really important part of puja is, is touching. Um, and this idea that, um, that actually touching is a form of veneration, a way of, um, of accessing the divine, of, of sort of intimately engaging with the divine um, and connecting with the divine. I think that um, I'm sort of acutely aware of the absence of touch in my life right now, being in spatial isolation and sort of self-quarantine out here in the middle of I'm not saying nowhere, but pretty isolated Minnesota right now and not, not around friends who I can hug and touch um, and even being afraid of hugging and touching my family because I don't want to, you know, spread germs. Um, but I realize how much we as humans need touch. We need that physical, haptic, corporeal relationship, that connection. Um, and, I, and I see that, that desire um, for touch, really beautifully illustrated in these kinds of practices in, in a puja. Um, I think also touching makes the divine, in these cases with Ganesh, more attainable, more accessible, mm -hmm. um, more sort of present in one's life. Um, and I just, you know, we, we sort of talked about this a little bit last week, where we sort of mentioned it, it reminded me, um, you know, Ganesh images in particular, I think, um, are sort of magnetic, even when we see them in museum. And these are two museum mm. um, images of Ganesh. Um, and even though we know we're not supposed to touch objects in museum, right? No, no touching, no spitting, no praying. Um, but there's, <laughs> I love praying is after touch spitting. <laughs> exactly, that's all part of the same thing, right? That there's, that we still have a sort of, the, uh, particularly for devotees, there's still a desire that these objects are sacred and desire that sort of drawn to them. Um, and to sort of limitedly touch them or sort of engage them mm -hmm. by, by placing a small offering, whether it's a monetary offering or a floral offering of some sort. Um, so yeah, that, and this is, this is that same Ganesh that mm -hmm. uh, my mother-in-law was um, adorning for the Ganesh Chaturthi back in 2004. This is an image actually from this year um, mm -hmm. of the same Ganesh now. Um, so yeah, those are, that's what I wanted to present for, for our discussion topic today. So. Wonderful. I really should include <coughs> other resources. That I, didn't <laughs> yeah, I can always add them later. But these right. are, oh, what I just want to say about these resources, yeah. so the image, the, the free, the Sackler Gallery, and you can totally put that online, mm -hmm. um, and they have a lot of great images. And then Catherine Castor, um, who's now curator at um, the Museum of Detroit, a South Asian curator, she's really smart, interesting woman. And she did her PhD dissertation at Columbia on mm. the uh, dynasty and has written also about other sculptural and sort of architectural forms of this kingdom. So you could always check out her work if you're interested. And then um, Diana Eck's book, which, you know, is so seminal, it's such an important text for, certainly for the field of South Asia. Um, this is a kind of classic one to read more about the concept of darshan, but she also talks about the sort of multi-sensory aspect of puja, right. um, including the haptic, the touch. So. Right. Wonderful. Yeah. So uh, I have quite a few images. I think when we were talking, me and Kristen were talking about sort of the concept of these type of mini lectures or mini discussions, we wanted to sort of tend to focus on one work, but I'm trying to find one work that encapsulates sort of this idea of touch in Chinese art and is actually quite difficult. <laughs> or what, uh, so I, I rather do, doing that, I want to focus on one medium. So there won't be one work, uh, although at the end, if there's time, I might go through one example very quickly to illustrate this idea. But I do want to sort of think about this issue of touch and this medium that is very uniquely, uh, although not Chinese, although many of them were taken sort of from this Chinese idea. Uh, in East Asia, but it's a very uniquely East Asian sort of artistic uh, medium or format, which is that of the hand scroll. 
So many of you probably have encountered uh, signs like this at a museum, although oftentimes these are reserved for uh, three-dimensional objects, uh, usually in the middle of the gallery. There's some sort of unspoken rule that when you go into a museum space, you don't touch or caress the paintings on the wall, or unless the, you're allowed, <laughs> the, the artist asks you to do so. So, but this is not always the case, at least in, uh, uh, in many sort of uh, original settings, uh, many of the paintings were meant to be touched. And this is especially the case in East Asia, specifically in China, uh, the area I'm most familiar with. Uh, and this is true from the creations of these, the creation of these works, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the medium, the tools that were used to create these work and to, uh, to the actual work, the way you handle the work itself. And this, this mini lecture is what I, I will introduce uh, to thinking about this relationship of touch and uh, in the uh, in, uh, uh, painting, especially hand scroll in general. So uh, to create a traditional Chinese uh, painting, uh, usually you would need these tools. Uh, they're so-called the four treasures of a scholar studio in China, the brush, the ink stick, the ink stone, and paper. Uh, and here is just a very quick sort of internet search image that illustrate these tools, the brush, uh, which is uh, made out of animal hair, the inkstone and the ink block itself, uh, and the paper on the uh, lower right hand corner, which is made out of mostly mulberry bark, uh, 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 tree barks and sort of other type of fibers. But as you can see, in order to produce the ink that is used, the black, uh, the sort of monochromatic black ink to, for painting, for most of the sort of uh, paintings in, in China and elsewhere, you need to uh, grind this sort of ink stone against the uh, hard surface of the rock. And that does take a very, it is a very laborious effort. Uh, you sort of uh, put a little water on it and then you start grinding it. And then at the end, you produce this sort of concentrated watery type of pigment. Then you can soak it up with your brush. And the different gradation, different coloration is dependent on how much more or less water you add onto this ink. Uh, to, to, uh, to, to get a sense of depth and different colors. Um, paper is also very important. Paper, and also I should also add silk, uh, is also used in many of these uh, as a medium on, on which the work is done. Uh, and the papers themselves, although it looks very fragile and thin, is actually quite resilient. In fact, oftentimes, uh, when people remount a painting or uh, conserve a painting, they need to entirely lift the paper entirely from its backing. And what you're actually seeing here is uh, conservators actually lifting the glue very slowly uh, off the back of this particular uh, painting, which uh, I think is paper, although this radiation may suggest it's silk but sort of really scraping very carefully, scraping away uh, all of these sort of glue. So you also need to have a very delicate hand when you're doing work like this, but also a very intimate knowledge of the material and medium that you're working with and how it behaves. Uh, here, just a couple more uh, uh, images of showcasing how people remount uh, these, paint, uh, these works of art. Uh, they, again, they would lift it off the mounting and then clean off the back uh, with very delicately and then apply a new sort of backing usually of paper and then mount the back, backing with fabric which that you see here these are uh, on the left is a, a 12th century uh, hand scroll in its form that you would usually find it uh, <coughs> protected by these beautiful brocade fabrics and textiles. And, and on the right is uh, an example of somebody trying to examine or uh, looking at this a hand scroll such as this. And, and indeed, it's also very interesting to think about and think it in a deeper level about these type of beautiful brocades and textile pattern that were part of the uh, the medium of a hand scroll, because this is the first thing that you would encounter. Even though these are meant to serve as a protection for the larger hand scroll, they play a very important and significant role uh, in thinking about the hand scroll as an object, but also in helping us date them as well.
and here just uh, people sort of give you a couple more images on how people are handling and really playing with uh, knowing the different texture, different patterns of the borders of the mound and needing to know not only have a knowledge, extensive knowledge of paper, but also an extensive knowledge of different fabrics and textile and how to work with them. And this, of course, requires a very uh, a specialized type of touch, uh, a touch, a very delicate touch on paper, but also a different type of touch when handling these type of material on the borders, for example. So <clears throat> I, I want to sort of then talk about how to look at a hand scroll, which this is actually how most of you will probably encounter uh, a hand scroll in a museum setting is when the hand scroll is completely rolled out in front of you, uh, when you can see the actual painting itself, oftentimes the title page, but also all of the colophons, which are these texts that were uh, sometimes done by the artist himself, uh, sometimes by uh, admirers and friends of the artist, but also uh, by collectors uh, who would also add their own thoughts uh, in writing and attach it to the, uh, to the end of the painting. So all of these would oftentimes be on display or depending on how long the table is, most of it would be on display. But that's not how these works were meant to be read. These works were meant to be read from right to left and thus the direction of text, at least in pre-modern China uh, uh, and many places in East Asia. Uh, you sort of, uh, you read from right to left one section at a time. So you're meant to open this at arm's length and only engage uh, with the hand scroll one section at a time. And when you finish, you roll it up with your right hand and then unroll it with your left hand, right? To sort of, it's almost like a cinematic uh, uh, type of experience. And what's so great about this experience, like watching a film at your home, at home, uh, you can go back and go forward if you would like to. So this is a very intimate type of engagement as well. So <clears throat> I just want to illustrate this, at least digitally, with a uh, very famous painting from the uh, 13th century in uh, the Sun and Song uh, with a great uh, scholar painter, Xia uh, <clears throat> Gui. Uh, it, it is a hand scroll, so you start from the very right-hand corner. I have the entire length of the painting reproduced on the bottom. Uh, in a very bad reproduction, but as you can see, on the right hand, you open it to one arm's length, and the painter actually gives you clues in, through his composition on this is where you should stop, and this is the area you should uh, really examine what's happening in front of you. This is a complete composition, if you will. Uh, for example, you have this large uh, squareish boulder on the left with this wonderful pine tree peeking out. Remember last week I talked about the one corner compositional system, then this is exactly the same one corner system at play. Again, this is the same period, same dynasty, same type of uh, cultural environment. So here is actually a self-contained scene within this much longer uh, hand scroll. And you, it, and then once you see this, then you can sort of move on. And there are hints because the next scene connects to this particular scene as well. So they are clues or pictorial clues that ask you, urge you to move on as well. Uh, also, I should also uh, further examine the scene. There's, in addition to this little clue, there's also this wonderful contrast between the background and the foreground. And the, the sort of very stereotypical Southern Song and Song style type of landscape composition where the middle ground is sort of completely obscure by mist or by clouds, right? It's very un unclear what the uh, spatial relationship is between the foreground and the background. Uh, the same here, our, as our eyes being led to this little rocky outcrop, again, one corner compositional system. Uh, the trees and the rock points repeat itself in the distant mountains in these sort of very misty, showery shapes of this distant mountain and a little sort of fishing village right here. Uh, but also note, our eyes are constantly moving. Our eyes are not static when we're looking at the, these uh, 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 hand scrolls. Our eyes are moving at different spots at the hand scroll, and that also takes us along this journey, uh, and they do envision this as a type of journey uh, through the landscape. 
experience. Uh, they are moments of drama, uh, and people have also compared uh, Hans Grohe as a musical score or a symphony score. There are moments of climax and drama, and there's also moments of coda or uh, sort of diminuendo, right? Sort of as the landscape itself peters out into these very soft, barely visible sceneries, much quieter sceneries. That itself is then followed by a huge crescendo uh, mm. of this dramatic landscape that confronts you right in the foreground. Uh, and you can get all, in fact, get a sense of the figures and how dramatic uh, the landscape, this cliff scene is supposed to be. So the drama is also inherent in this sort of format. Uh, and the artist asks you to experience all of these episodes, the, the sort of quiet and calmness of the lake, but also the drama of these sort of, uh, these wonderful sort of cliff uh, that sort of, it seems also turns itself in, having this wonderful inner light that emulates from within this valley as well. So mm -hmm. that's, that's all I have about sort of thinking about touch and Chinese uh, painting as a Chinese scroll as a medium uh, that sort of convey this idea of touch. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I, I have a question about the ink mm. and I guess the touch of moving the ink on the stone. Mm -hmm. is, is the ink stick itself, it's carbon black or what lamp black? How is it made? What is the material? Um, I, it is uh, burnt. It is charcoal with uh, burnt resin uh, from pine. And there are other material, other ingredients there too. But yeah, it is carbon uh, base. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, yeah. I, I think it's also very fascinating to sort of think about, um, you know, because I think one of the difficulty during this time of uh, quarantine and sort of self isolation, right, is that. And this is also why we picked this topic is this like sense of touch, because we are lacking the sense, sense of touch, right? And to, especially in your work, I think this sort of sense of touch is so much about establishing a relationship, a relationship with the divine or a relationship, and for our touch, uh, a relationship with the people that you're shaking hands off or you are sort of giving a sort of kiss to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe we can even think about that too with the, the, with the hand scroll. When you're examining the hand scroll, that when you threw the touch through the rolling and unrolling, and you are establishing a relationship with not, not only about the artwork itself, but also because Chinese art is so much about establishing a relationship with the old master who inspire you or the old master whose steps you're following. Absolutely. It's I mean, also, there's, yeah. there's layers of touches, right? I mean, that was very. Yeah. Part what I was inspired, but why I wanted to ask about the ink, because I was yeah. thinking about the actual grinding of the ink on the stone and sort mm -hmm. of that haptic relationship, and then I was thinking about the brocade, and I know you yeah. you didn't even you didn't talk much about the actual yeah. weft weaving process, but but that also if you're using a draw loom or if you're using it, it's right. structure, you would have one person who's maybe manipulating. Um, yeah, the, you know, the thread that another person's that's actually sitting at the loom. So you could have multiple people whose hands are engaged in that process of weaving, and then the stitching you had of showing mm -hmm. of sort of creating that border or that they're sort of binding. Yeah. So, um, in addition to the you know the removing of the paste and the reactivation yeah. of the backing, so all of those layers of touch in the making of the scroll, and mm -hmm. then you know, the, the looking at the scroll, which you described so beautifully. And, um, and I love those images of sort of people in these landscapes look, and sort of imagining them and looking at these wonderful right. landscapes. Right. Right? The sort of right. mirroring of that space. And also there's something about the scroll as a mobile object, right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. you could then take it places. It's not the thing that's Absolutely. stuck on the wall or it's yeah. framed and placed in a yeah. precious place, but it's the thing yeah. that you carry with you um, right. and then share it with others through, again, through right. sort of exchanges right. and such. Um, right, right. I, I mean, this is, in fact, a lot of, uh, they are stories of painters and scholars who would carry on, carry their favorite, I mean, the Ember Chenlong carries versions of his favorite scrolls and they take it everywhere, you know, yeah. uh, to trying to match the, uh, what they encounter in nature, a particularly historic site with a certain type of poetics that they find in the works themselves and sort of uh, 
not necessarily trying to match the scenery, but trying to match the sentiment of the scenery, you know? Yeah. And even the colophon too, right? Is this yeah. way of um, certainly transcribing the, the words or the ideas and the, the text yeah. pen, right? Um, yeah. Of, of different, different people who would be holding and looking at Absolutely. Them. Yeah. Um, no, no, I just love that. Um, yeah. I love, I mean, I'm not thinking about all the people involved. <laughs> but I, I think also another thing that I want to sort of mention too is that I think there is such a wonderful sense, uh, you know, be, I think we, 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 it's, it's such an evolutionary thing, you know, like children or babies when they're born is all about tasting also, which could also be a great topic. A way of, <laughs> tasting. A way of feeling. Right. Or, and, but also touching, right? Sort of like touching and getting a sense of the world. Uh, is that it is, uh, to think about the different material and medium, right? And this is something that I would also I try to emphasize in, in uh, my talk is, uh, you know, the, the feeling of brocade or silk brocade is going to be so different from feeling the touch of the paper, right? Yeah. And I think for you too, also uh, touching the Ganesh uh, stone uh, sculpture is going to be very different from touching a terracotta, right? Well, and this not, of, absolutely. That's actually why I intentionally chose that object too, because yeah. a sculpture is usually the thing you think you're not supposed to touch, right? Certainly right. you're not supposed to touch it. Right. And it's different from, for me, the sort of obvious object of touch are textiles. Yeah. Right, it's it's the yeah. first thing you do when you find a piece of fabric is you want to sort of feel it between your fingers, yeah. see what, yeah, yeah. what that texture is like. Um, mm -hmm. And stone doesn't immediately lend itself to thinking about engaging with it in that way. But um, but I love that in particularly in that stone image, how you can see what must have been centuries of people touching that object, touching. Mm -hmm. stone touching the knees, maybe even touching mm -hmm. the belly or the feet um, as a way of worshiping, as a way of engaging with this object. Um, and that it's, it's present, it's the sort of residue um, on, on the stone object. Um, yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, next week we might have a guest. We don't know exactly Good. sure who it is. So I also want to sort of, uh, I think, uh, uh, to speak about this, this project too, to, to think about this as not just a uh, narcissistic con uh, conversation between me and Kristen, but really sort of open up and invite our colleagues and uh, in yeah. the museum, in the academia. And, uh, and in, beyond, in, actually. I want to invite yeah. our friends and colleagues who are makers too. Exactly. To, to join in conversation to sort of talk about both their work, but also to, to ruminate on a particular sort of art historical or art visual sort of uh, aspect. So stay tuned. Yeah. Uh, and and think, the goal also is to go live so that we can yes. have a broader conversation and have yes. more people involved in, yeah. um, in the discussion. So we're still yeah. tr trying to figure out the yeah. sort of technological logistical part of that, but, yeah. but absolutely um, yeah. stay tuned for more conversations in yeah. the future and to participate in them too. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you next. Be well. Talk to you next week. <laughs>